Imagine you are in a lab in the 18th century and you are a scientist trying to figure out electricity. You already know that objects can have a positive or negative static electricity, which we will refer to as positive or negative charge. Two bodies with the same charge repel each other and two oppositely charged bodies attract each other. You are a physicist and you want to make a law out of this. So how do you proceed? Well, first that comes to mind is to test how this force depends on the distance between the bodies. And with some error due to grounding and so on, you find out that the force is inversely proportional to the second power in distance, if the two bodies are spherical. Even though there is some error in your measurement, there is no reason to think that this proportionality differs from r to the power of 2. The nature would be really weird if it was like 2 to the power of 2.1 or something. So you find out it behaves the same as Newton's law of gravitation. Okay, so what is next? You will observe that on the same distance, the force is always different, since each body contains different amount of charge, and you have to incorporate this to the law. And at this time, it's impossible to know exactly how much electricity, or in current words, charge each body contains. There is not a machine that would give you a specific amount of charge each time. Charging an object is always done by friction, which can only give you unspecified amount. So how do you proceed if you can't create a specific amount of electricity to define the unit of charge? Let's call the amount of electricity each body contains as Q1 and Q2. What could the law be then? Should we make it a sum, multiply, sum and square, or multiply and square? Looking at the gravitational law, we have the best candidate. But this is just guessing, it's not physics. Well, you know you can have an uncharged body and put it next to a charged body and you will find out that the force is zero. Therefore, it can't be addition rule. You can be a little bit nitpicky about this, since a charged body can polarize the neutral body, causing a non-zero force. But this is an effect of higher order, and at this time you have no capabilities of measuring this. Okay, so we know the addition rules are out, so it has to be multiplication rule. But since you don't have a machine that gives you a specific amount of charge, then you don't know what these numbers are. So any order of magnitude is possible. Now you have to employ some knowledge about how electricity works. It seems like if you charge a body, the charge gets evenly distributed throughout the whole volume of the body, provided it's made of a conductive material. If the body is made of conductor, the distribution happens very quickly after the charge is acquired. Then if you bring another body of the same shape, made of the same material that is uncharged, and we touch the charged body, the charge gets immediately distributed evenly across the two bodies. Now you can use this rule to halve the charge even though you can't know the exact value. Imagine you have two charged bodies that act on each other with a force, let's say, 10 newtons. Now you can bring a neutral body and touch one of them, and the force decreases to 5 newtons. Now you can test these expressions, and you will find out which one is correct. Okay, now for the sake of curiosity, precision, and maybe some boredom, let's try to use a ball of twice the radius. Radius of a ball goes like r to the power of 3, so the ball with double the radius will have 8 times the volume. This means that if we touch the smaller ball, we would expect the charge to redistribute itself this way, and the force should drop significantly, right? Well, that's the expectation, but in reality it would drop to just a third of the original value. But what? We've already ruled out all other possibilities, so the problem must lie somewhere else. Maybe the charge distributes itself differently after touching the balls than we thought. But since we originally choose completely the same balls, we missed this issue. Because no matter what the rule is, the same balls are the same balls, 
if they are in electrostatic equilibrium, they have to contain the same amount of charge if they are completely the same. Otherwise, there will be a current involved. But you are here to study Coulomb's law, right? This is nice issue you just discovered, but let other physicists deal with this. Or, you know, I'm going to tell you. It's not the volume of the body that charge distributes itself to, but the surface. I'm showing this on 2D, but you get the point. But that is not the whole story. The surface of a ball grows with the second power of the radius, which would mean that the ball with double the radius could contain four times the charge. And after touching the smaller ball, the force would decrease to the fifth of the original value, not third. That is really weird because if it's not the volume nor surface, then what else it could be? And yeah, it is the surface, but there is additional rule to it. The charge distributes itself in such a way that the electric intensity inside the volume is zero everywhere. But it's better to explain this using electric potential. So what is it? If you have a charged ball, then it creates an electric field around itself. If you place a charged particle near it, for example, with the same sign of charge as the ball, then it will be repelled and accelerated and it will eventually get a certain number of kinetic energy at infinity. Of course, this energy also depends on the amount of charge this particle contains. And therefore, you can define electric potential at a certain point as the energy a particle gets per unit of charge at infinity. Or you can also think about it in a way how much energy you need to bring the particle from infinity to a certain point. If the two bodies are oppositely charged, then the logic is other way around. You need energy to pull out the particle to the infinity and the particle gains energy from infinity to a certain point. The charge distributes itself in such a way that this potential is constant inside the volume and therefore is exactly the same right on the surface of the body of any shape. This means if you put a charged particle at any point on the surface of the body in electrostatic equilibrium, it will get the same kinetic energy at infinity. If you account for this rule, you will get that the capacity of the metal ball to hold the charge is directly proportional to the first power of radius. This story might be worth another video, but anyway, let's get back to the Coulomb's law. So you were able to find out that the force is directly proportional to the product of the two charges. But in modern Coulomb's law, there is this thing. So how did it get there? Well, we still need to somehow quantify the electric charge. We should give it some units, but how can we do that? How do you give a unit to something that you don't have a specific method to generate specific amount. We need to create an object that we could say have, for example, five units of charge. We need concrete number. Okay, first, what should the units be? By simple math, you can find out that the unit of charge is square root of Newton times meter. And now you can call it somehow. But you don't have to use Newtons and meters. You can also use different units, for example, square root of dyne times centimeter, where one newton is 10 to the 5 dyne. And this is a unit of charge that actually exists, and it's called by three different names, Franklin, Stadt-Coulomb, or ESU. And the system of units is called the Gaussian CGS units. So in translation, if you have two electric bodies charged at one Franklin separated by one centimeter, then they will act with a force of one dyne on each other. Okay, but I want to have an object that is charged to a specific amount, for example, 10 Franklins. So how can I make some? Well, I can charge one ball to an unknown charge, then bring another ball that is exactly the same and touch it, and the charge will distribute evenly. Now I know that I have two balls with exactly the same charge. Let's place them at distance of one centimeter from each other for simplicity. 
and measure the force. Let's say we measure 100 dyno force. Then we can easily calculate that each body has charge of 10 Franklin. But that is kind of unsatisfactory. You can only measure charge by measuring the force. But this force can also depend on the medium you have the balls in. And there is the problem that you have to alter the charge of the original body by halving it in order to measure its charge. So overall, it's not very practical. But now imagine people discover that electricity can not only be a huge static discharge that happens in milliseconds, but by combining some metals, you can have a source of continuous electricity. And we know that electricity is a charge that is moving through the wire. The question becomes, can we use this fact somehow to define it better? So we know that current is a moving charge and therefore we can define a new unit called ampere, which is the amount of charge that passes through a certain area of the wire per second. Now we have two options. We can use the definition of charge as we know it from the Coulomb's law to define what the current is, which at this time seems completely crazy because we have problems to measure charge of just one body, let alone charge that is passing in a wire, or we can somehow define the unit of current and then derive what the charge is. But if we decide to go down this road, then it becomes clear that this formula we have derived can no longer be true for the new charge. And to compensate for this change, we have to multiply the formula by a certain constant. But of course, the value of this constant depends on how we define the current. So how we do that? Well, there are many ways. For example, you can standardize the metals you use to create the battery and call the generated current one ampere. But there is a problem that such battery will slowly lose its ability to generate current. And there is also the problem with the purity of the materials you use. Different purities will have different generated current. But overall, it's still improvement. But as you're figuring this problem out, another discovery just happens. People discover that there is a magnetic field around wire under current. So maybe by measuring the strength of this magnetic field, you can define the unit of current. So how to measure the strength of magnetic field? By measuring the force, it acts on a moving charged particle. But that brings us back to the problem of charging a body in the first place. Or you can measure the force this magnetic field acts on another magnet or ferromagnetic material. But then you have to somehow standardize the materials you use and you also run into a problems with purities of these materials. But ampermeters like this were built. But we need something that can be replicated in any laboratory without need of specific materials that were used to define the current in the first place. So how to do it? Again, current is moving charge and moving charge is influenced by magnetic field. So two wires under current next to each other should act on each other by a force. And you can measure this force. And the definition people came up with is the following. Take two infinite parallel wires with negligible cross-section, set them one meter apart, and the force of 2 times 10 to the minus 7 newtons per meter of length means there is one ampere of current in each wire. This might seem weird at first, because we don't have infinite wires, and also you have to have like infinitely thin wire, and there have to be the same current in both wires. But now you have exact blueprint how to make the precision of your measurement arbitrarily large. First, you connect the wires to the same source to have the same current in the wires. You want to use the thinniest wire you have, and you want to make the length as large as possible. And by improving on these measures, you will improve your measurement of the current. Of course, it's very impractical to measure current this way, 
But now you can use any other method of measuring current, like this one, and calibrate it using our definition. Because being able to calibrate it what matters. So now the charge that accumulates over one second on a plate of capacitor charged by one ampere is a new unit of charge that we call Coulomb. And the units are ampere times second. Now, if you take two bodies charged by one Coulomb and place them one meter apart, the force they will act on each other is almost 9 billion newtons. And therefore, to make the equation for Coulomb's law correct, the constant itself has to have this value. So as you can see, there is a downside of making ampere the fundamental unit, because it renders the Coulomb, the unit of charge, impractically large. But if we define the current using the old charge, then the current would be very small. So it's basically give or take. But the main takeaway of this is that we choose current to be fundamental unit because it's much easier to measure. Now you can ask why we used this particular number of newtons per meter in definition of ampere. And the reason is history. Apart from the fact that you want to have the ampere to be a practically sized unit. And this video wasn't meant to reproduce history by any means. The definition of ampere I showed you happened much later after the discovery of Maxwell's equations. In Maxwell's equations, we use the notion of electric and magnetic fields. And with that, we have the permittivity and permeability of space, which are constants that tell us how the medium around responds to applied electric or magnetic field. If you were to calculate the force between current carrying conductors using Ampere's law, you would get this. And therefore, by defining one ampere as this force per meter of length between two current carrying wires, we fix the value of permeability of free space to exactly this number. But after the year of 2019, this value is no longer fixed and must be measured, since ampere was defined by fixing the value of elementary charge to this value. And therefore, one ampere is this number of elementary charges per second. If we go back to the Coulomb's law, in modern notation, we write it like this to make it consistent with the Gauss law. So this 4 pi is not arbitrary, but it's a remnant of the integration over the surface. I will probably shine light on permittivity and permeability in another video. So it should become more clear why all these equations look the way they do. So definitely subscribe if you want to know more about electromagnetism. And also big thanks to all of my generous supporters on Patreon. I really appreciate your help. Thank you and see you soon.